My name is Allison Wyckoff. I'm the Associate Director of Public and Community Programs here at the Asian Art Museum. And on behalf of the museum, I would like to welcome you to tonight's program and thank you for your generous support. It's wonderful sharing space with all of you and being able to enjoy, enjoy the museum in person. Um, it's been way too long. <laughs> We have an incredible slate of exhibitions currently on view, including I Look for the Sky by the artist Zheng Chongbin, who we are fortunate to have with us here tonight. He'll be in conversation with eco-political theorist Mayo Kovskaya. And unfortunately, our other guest, eco-philosopher Timothy Morton, is stuck in Paris and is unable to be here with us. However, after the program, Chongbin and Maya will take anyone who's interested into the exhibition for a quick tour and to answer questions in that space. So please stick around for that if you're able. To start tonight's program, the Asian Art Museum acknowledges that we are located on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramaytush Ohlone, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the indigenous stewards of this land and in accordance with their traditions, the Ramaytush Ohlone have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as the caretakers of this place, as well as for all peoples who reside in their traditional territory. As guests, we recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. We wish to pay our respects by acknowledging the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramaytush Ohlone community and by affirming their sovereign rights as First Peoples. To introduce the speakers, I'm going to pass the mic to Abby Chen, head of the Contemporary Curatorial Department here. Um, Abby and her team work tirelessly to present stories and ideas often overlooked by the mainstream through exhibitions that encourage deeper thinking about our relationship to the world. I Look for the Sky is a profound example of the ways in which art can bring new awareness to our environment, and I want to welcome Abby to the podium. Thank you, Alison. It's really good to be back in a room full of people in three dimensions. And, but I cannot be more thrilled to know that, Maya, you travel all the way across the Pacific to come joining us. So I cannot be more grateful. Knowing that Chongbin is going to give a tour, um, I also want to show off this catalog that is still available in our boutique because we work so hard on this book during COVID. And this is also something very unique because we together really feel that it's important for us to think about publication differently when we have installation art, that we must have the installation photos that are included in the publication. So, Chongbin was the artist come to the mind when we think about what it means to have a transformed museum. Before I go into introducing today's uh, speaker, I do want to start with a paragraph I wrote for this exhibition in the state of movement. The Asian Art Museum of San Francisco's embrace of contemporary art into its core initiatives is not only a critical addition to predominant museum models of conservation and presentation, it's also a statement that the Bay Area art scene is engaging culturally and politically with the rest of the world. This momentous direction is significant in an era that is extremely complex in the world and turbulent. The increasing polarized global climate presents urgent challenges of all museums. To stay relevant by leading and responding to the present discourse, museums must set in place a different logic and modality of contemporary art practices that generate new knowledges, as well as willingness to experiment, even if this could result in unfamiliar conflicts and contradictions. And we're going to hear all about that from our today's speaker. And I'm so proud to introduce Maya Kovaskaya. Travel all the way from Chiang Mai to San Francisco, but this is a familiar neighborhood for you because you did your school here. And also, I just learned that almost eight years ago, 
that you work with Britta and to do a joint talk with us. So happy to see both of you and welcome. Maya had this long biography that even if I have the whole night, I would not be able to finish it. But I had a great privilege to write together with Maya for another significant artist, Chen Haiyan. So I grew great admiration for how you write. So such a privilege to be in the same room with you. So without further ado, we're going to dive right into it. And I'm going to give the floor to both Maya and Chongbin. And Chongbin, I just cannot emphasize enough how much that you help us not only transform the space, but also transform our ideas, and also how that we think about museum differently from exhibition, experiment, publication, and how we engage with our audience. So to both of you, thank you so much. <laughs> Okay, I'm now. Am I using this mic or this mic? The mic. Yeah. This one. You're on, right? Oh, now. okay, here we go. Uh, double mics, this is like the new normal. <laughs> so, first of all, I just want to thank everyone who made such an incredible effort to bring me here um, the museum, Allison, and uh, of course, Abby and Chongbin more than anyone, because without Chongbin, I would never have done the research that I did or written the things that I wrote, and the collaborations between us over the last decade have been formative in my own intellectual development, my own scholarly practice, my own curatorial practice, um, and Chongbin has just been one of the most wonderful artists to collaborate with in my entire almost 20-year curatorial career. Um, before I begin, I want to say that how pleased I am that we started here with a land acknowledgement, but I would like to add a little of my own to that. It's become I'm glad that it's become a norm to acknowledge the traditional lands of indigenous peoples who had their lands violently taken from them um, by settler colonial power and had their cultures almost completely eradicated by the dominant Western way of life. Uh, but I want to go a step further, and I want to say that decolonization is not a metaphor, to take a phrase from Eve Tuck and Yang's article. Decolonization is not a metaphor. If we're very serious about what the land acknowledgments actually mean and the reasons for making them, that indigenous ways of life, ways of living with the planet rather than against it or from it as parasites extracting value, but instead living in balance with nature, if that way of life is now a key to the survival of the human species, which I believe it is, given that 85% of the existing biodiversity on the planet is under the stewardship of 3% of the population who are in fact indigenous. So I want to say that the land acknowledgements are the beginning, but that we need real decolonization, which should start with the return of the stolen lands to the stewardship and care for reparations to the indigenous peoples everywhere in the world if we want to make good on actually the promise of combating the Anthropocene and climate catastrophe that Western modern civilization has brought on us. And with that also reparations for slavery because those two, genocide and ecocide, slavery and, and uh, colonization were the two twin forces that powered the building of this modern world that has created such an incredibly destructive, ontologically constitutive rupture of humans, not all humans, but the modern dominant model of being human from the natural world. And that's one of the things I'm going to talk about today. So I just wanted to put in my land acknowledgement is that um, not only to acknowledge the traditional indigenous peoples here, as have already been done, but to acknowledge that this world, this earth that we live on belongs to all Terran beings, not just human ones, and that we need to learn to live with them. So I want to just start by talking a little bit about this installation that you have the incredible experience to come walking through with us after the talk. Because I wrote about it for the publication and writing about it taught me things that I would like to share with you uh, as much as we have time for today. After I've talked about some of the ways of thinking 
and um, ways of engaging with the natural world through the embodied experience of art that Chongbin's installation affords us, then we are going to a sort of dialogue, you know, and with Q&A, and let's make this informal and comfortable, and people should feel like when we're having a back and forth, if you have questions, just ask them. Um, we want to have a conversation and have everybody feel like that they are welcome to be part of that. So when you walk into the Bogart Court here, you will see, if you look up, looking for the sky, iridescent patterns of shimmering, moving light that catch your eyes as you enter the atrium. Hanging near the skylights of the building is the immersive environmental installation, and it offers us an unexpected and playful encounter with the natural world. The artwork reveals our entanglement with the dynamic physical processes of nature, and it poses a challenge to our basic understandings of the character of the non-human world and our relationship to the more than human or other than human world. These iridescent patterns suspended in space embody a series of virtual skies located within the airy interior of the skylit atrium. And those skies can be regarded as what philosopher Michel Foucault called a heterotopia. We know dystopia and utopia, and a hetero we know means not the same or different. A heterotopia is a place within a place or a site within a site that mirrors and yet troubles, turns upside down, and sometimes transforms that which it mirrors. These patterns that you see when you look at the installation are produced by a process called diffraction that pertains to the phenomena that exhibit the behavior of waves. Um, so I'm gonna give you a little science background so we can understand what, what's actually going on in your eyes and the, in, in the room with the work when you're engaging with it. Because it's, it's not just a material object in a museum space. There's something a lot more going on here. So optical diffraction occurs when light moves around obstacles or passes through multiple apertures, creating many radiating wave patterns, kind of similar to that Wi-Fi icon that we all have on our computer or phones. Radiating wave patterns as the flows of multiple waves encounter one another, overlapping, bouncing off each other, and creating interference patterns in the process. If diffraction occurs in wave behaviors of water as well, like when a river flows, moves to flow around rocks, when overlapping wakes of multiple boats produce interference patterns in the water, when stones are dropped into the water and create series of outward radiating ripples, all of these are interference patterns. Diffraction occurs in, um, also develops around sound waves as they move around physical barriers and other phenomena. Okay, so discovering that light acts like a fluid when it encounters a barrier was a, an incredible transformation in optical science. Okay, and this was in like the 1600s. So Grimaldi dubbed this diffraction, which comes from the idea of um, the Latin verb diffringere, to dis, break apart, okay? So the, the breaking apart of the waves. And so as the natural light that pours through the Bogart court skylight bathes you, as you move your head and your eyes and your body, diffraction patterns appear in the waves of subtle iridescence that respond to your movements in the heterotopic skies of the installation above you. And so this formerly underutilized rectangle of skylit space is suddenly comes to life as a heterotopic site, a place within a place that both mirrors and troubles that mirror image. It's a space containing multiplicities. Here human and more than human agency, world-making capacity, meet and make diffraction patterns that engender something far more beautiful and profound than what appears to superficially be the totality of the artwork. So, what is the nature of this site-specific artwork that Zheng Chongbin has made? What is its ontological and categorical status? Is it a sculpture? Is it an installation? Or is it something much more than any of those familiar categories of art object? And how would you know what it is? So while it may resemble a sculpture or an installation piece, to confuse the work with a species of aesthetic object that you typically associate with artworks in a gallery space would be a mistake. At first glance, you may indeed suppose that the installation scaffolding 
overlaid with delicate screens and scored, roofed sheets of plastic film and acrylic, is itself the artwork. It's a logical guess, right? But this is not a wholly accurate description. It would be akin to confusing the physical apparatus of a movie theater, the architectural space in which you sit, with the movie that you watch in that space. However, unlike a film that is screened for an audience, which repeats for each viewer at the same, each screening exactly the same way, the movie here is unique to each person who sees it. There is no beginning, there's no end, there's no narrative or plot, and yet there is a non-kinetic, almost zen-like, meditative action contained within the appearance of stillness, dynamism within the frame of something you expect to be static. There is a deeper meaning that unifies the viewing experience nonetheless. And that is that there is a systematic similarity in the visual quality of the aesthetic experiences each viewer will have, even though the exact experiences will be unique. So to understand the deeper meaning of this artwork, you must first also understand that you are a collaborator. Rather than a passive recipient partaking in the consumption of a preformed content or object, but what does this actually mean, that you're a collaborator in making the artwork? What then is the artwork in question, and how does your perceptual engagement with it intra-actionally help to constitute the work? Yes, you heard me right. I didn't say interactionally. I said intra-actionally. The feminist philosopher of science and physicist, Karen Barad, who happens to teach at UC Santa Cruz, comes up with a term, intra-action, to help us understand this nature of what's called in fancy terms relational ontology, which basically means things shape each other together and mutually cons constitute one another through the relationships. We come into being with each other, not static preformed selves that exist outside of our connections to each other and our relationships to the world. So, She's written extensively about the idea of intraaction, which she defines as an inseparable, entangled relationality. So being in the world is relational. And she posits that being is in part a function of co-becoming, becoming with, through the relationalities that we have with various entities, organisms, beings in the world. Phenomena and entities do not pre-exist their entanglement with one another, per se, but rather they emerge through the multiple modes of relationality in which they are entangled. This intraaction is distinct from intraaction is distinct from interaction, which assumes that the units or the agents have integral discreteness and constitutive completeness, and that they are ontologically, that their very being is separate and discrete, and that those discrete agents engage in some action together. But with intra-action, we need to think about the, all the agents participating as being constituted through the encounters with one another. So by definition, it's a con mutually constitutive relationship, a very different way of thinking about our relationship to pretty much everything in the world, living and non-living. So if you focus on the dynamic intra-action, uh, in I Look for the Sky. You can see how the separation of the question of being from knowing is misguided. Um, you can't actually know what a thing is separately from how you know what it is. That interaction takes a philosophical stance of engagement and the relationality shapes all the parties. So the dynamic physics of the materials, artwork's materials, including the light waves, pouring down from the actual literal skies above the, uh, the building that house the virtual heterotopic skies, the physical laws, chemical compositions that govern how various materials work, behave, the way the cones in your eyes capture and process light, the changing stances you activate with your body, they're all mutually constitutive of the artwork. And this means with each encounter of the artwork, the shape of what you see, experience, and participate in making is constantly being reformed and reconstituted through this dynamic interactional entanglement and engagement between you, the materials, the light, the apparatus installed by the artist, and each viewing alters you, changes your understanding of yourself in relation as well. 
Uh, there's a whole bunch of interesting stuff about how Karen Broad came to this idea by looking at Niels Bohr, and we can talk about that in Q&A if you want to talk about light behaving as both particles and waves. But to understand uh, the sort of key ideas I want us to bring to our engagement with the work, um, I think I can tell you a little bit about how the work is set up as an apparatus for you to complete by engaging with it. So the hanging geometric frames, they scaffold perforated screens and transport, transparent films that are scored with lots of innumerable thin lines, like the grooves of an old vinyl record. And the grooves form a net form a diffraction grid. The grid filters light through myriad tiny apertures. The light traverses those apertures on its way from the actual sky into the heterotopic sky of the work and then into your eyes, okay? So, um, there's a scientific explanation about how the eye re receives light that we can talk about as well, but basically, when your body encounters light waves, interference patterns, etc., um, then you activate the artwork. So, obviously the artwork's not a physics experiment, and it does not depend on you understanding the physics of, an, of light um, to experience it. But nevertheless, it's through your active engagement, rather than passive consumption, of the site-specific work, that the natural processes that are flowing through the space offer you an opportunity for self-reflective embodied experience of that entanglement of your own being with the specific agent-like capacities okay, of the non-human material world. And those will shape, in part, your aesthetic encounter. Okay, so the problem is, because of the ways that um, our dominant ideologies of human agency that have been overvalorized since the Enlightenment, basically since the scientific revolution, with people like Descartes, Francis Bacon, etc., we have come to axiomatically typically think of Humans is the only agents out there, the only game in town, and rarely see the world outside of ourselves as possessing and enacting agential qualities. And by agential, by agency, I mean world-making capacities. Okay, so it's no coincidence that the dominant Enlightenment ideology projects humans as godlike actors in a world of passive, mute, inert material over which we strive to exert ultimate control and dominion. The idea of the human that came out of the Enlightenment and still exists today, reaching its pinnacle, its apogee in, in people like Elon Musk, who wants you know, to make humans a multi-planet species instead of trying to save our multi-species planet. Uh, the, 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 this idea of humans as almost godlike actors, the only agency that works like a master craftsman on the natural world, and understanding our own power as filtered through this idea of ourselves as the masters of nature, I want to suggest is part of the underlying reason that we're in the mess we're in, that we're experiencing the multiple breakdowns of climate systems, that the biosphere is in the worst crisis that it's ever been in, caused by another species since 2.4 billion years ago, when the cyanobacteria just created oxygen and killed off almost all of the anaerobic life forms, creating the world that we eventually evolved into. And so this ideology of human ontological separateness, that our being is separate from and dominant over the natural world, has led to vast, powerful, anthropogenic, humanly caused processes of systemic interference in the planet's physical life, life support systems, upon which we sometimes forget that we all irreducibly depend to live. Intraaction and diffraction remind us that we are not alone, that we are entangled in a dynamic universe that is, as Karen Barad implies, always meeting us halfway. So I'm going to, we can talk more in a little later if you want about the heterotopia um, part of this, but Foucault had this idea of heterotopia, which was really cool and interesting, but there was a problem in this idea. And there's a critique of it that diffraction brings to us, okay? So if the heterotopia idea of a place within a place, this image, this metaphor of the mirror, right, that 
chosen inversion. Uh, Foucault wanted it to give us a sort of, create a shadow, like the mirror image, a shadow that gives my visibility to myself and enables me to see where I, I am absent. Right, and starting from that gaze the into that virtual space on the other side of the glass, then the mirror functions as a place that occupies the moment when I look at myself in the glass that is once at once real and connected with the space that surrounds it, but also absolutely unreal. I'm not actually in the mirror, right? So this idea is really generative, but there's a problem with this metaphor. The metaphor of the mirror, because it's rooted in a language of illumination that goes back to that enlightenment ideology and rationality I was just talking about. The idea that knowledge is something that we seek to discover about some kind of fixed, external, objective, unitary, sort of objective truth and reality that, that is independent of us and can be known. Um, and so, the critique of this way of thinking um, by people like Karen Barad and also her colleague, the, the feminist philosopher of science, Donna Haraway, who is a pioneer of multi-species studies, uh, the critique of this way of thinking argues that, that thinking of the light, of enlightenment, showing us an objective world that exists separately from outside of us just reinforces that idea of this separation, right? And so she says that the trope of unmediated light is a way to see a separate bedrock reality, as if it could be objectively mirrored in some totalizing knowledge. And she rejects the idea of knowledge as a mirror-like reflection of a pre-existing external reality that is supposed, presumed, to be independent of that knowledge. Instead, she offers a modest notion, rather than the fantasy of this totalizing godlike objectivity, what she calls the god trick. She argues instead that uh, the only real objectivity available to us is through the acknowledgement of partial perspectives, incomplete knowledge, partial perspectives from our position of situated knowledge. We're, we're always someplace where, where we can't see a totalizing view. The idea of a totalizing view, she says, is a god trick. It's a view from everywhere. The other side of the flip coin is the ultimate total relativization. It says there is no there is no objectivity possible. There is no truth. The view from nowhere is just as fake as the view from everywhere, she says. So instead, we want to try to situate ourselves in relation, again, to the things that we want to know and understand that active knowing shapes us and the thing that we want to know. So substituting the metaphor of reflection in the heterotopia with a metaphor of diffraction, okay, the, the patterns of interference produced by waves bumping into each other, offers us a different way of thinking. And so Karen Barad took this idea and she took it a step further and after taking diffraction from her work in theoretical physics, she applied it to our ways of looking at the material world in general. And Chong Bin, as a student of many kinds of philosophy, has really absorbed the, the insights of these ways of thinking and created a work that allows us to access these patterns with our bodies experientially through the artwork. So what diffraction does, okay, is it gives us conceptual traction better than reflection because diffraction does not produce the same displaced like in the mirror, as reflection and refraction do, Haraway says. Diffraction is a mapping of interference, not a replication, reflection, and reproduction. And a diffraction pattern does not map where differences appear, but rather, and this is what's key, it maps where the effects of differences appear. Right, because the, the, the diffraction pattern comes when the waves are bouncing off each other, you're interfering with each other, creating something new that's intra-actional, okay? So, diffraction patterns record the history of the interference, the reinforcement, and the difference. In other words, it allows us to see the heterogeneity there instead of trying to sort of make something the object of knowledge so that we can control it and, and simplify it. And it becomes a metaphor for a different kind of critical consciousness.
And this is the reason that um, I was so intrigued by I Look for the Sky. This artwork, it's not a spotlight to shine down on a, on a truth that exists independently outside of ourselves. It's not a nod to solipsism, but it's a space in which, however briefly, we can meet the universe halfway. And by seeing the diffraction patterns, like literally go lie on the couch when we're walking through. Lie on the couch and watch the edges move as, as the work comes to life with you before your eyes, subtly but tangibly there. By seeing these patterns of our entanglements with the mattering universe, we might come to know a different sort of truth altogether. And moreover, because the artwork requires our embodied engagement for its fulfillment, it also means that to experience that truth with our bodies doesn't require some remote intellectual abstraction. You go and you feel it and experience it. Quietly look up at the sky and see what happens. So Jung Tuan Bin has set the stage for you to become participants in this collaboration with the agential world-making forces of nature. And in this way, you as participants at this uh, exhibition are gonna help enact a unique aesthetic experience. And that experience is the essence of the artwork. And it's a reminder of the extraordinary nature of seemingly ordinary processes, right? Light, the, the, the airflow in the room, stuff that we just don't pay attention to at all. These seemingly ordinary processes of the physical universe all around us, to which we modern Western beings have become far too oblivious and inured. So imagine that diffractive power of seeing ourselves knocked off the pedestal of imagined human supremacy, our godlike sovereign agency displaced. How might it help us to see ourselves anew if we could see through this diffractive heterotopia ourselves displaced? even momentarily, from the role enshrined in our dominant enlightenment ideology that tells us that we humans alone possess agency, that we alone make the world meaningful, that we alone have the exceptionalist power to dispose of with the world and do with it as we please, even at the risk of exploitation, extraction, extinction, eradication, or erasure. The embodied experience of the artwork is a diffractive heterotopia that can allow us to see ourselves not as the same, but displaced, displaced as in Foucault's mirror image, but as a part of a heterotopia of diffractive mappings of our own entangled, heterogeneous, shared existence on this planet. And it's not a cerebral, it's not a purely cerebral existence. So I hope that when we go walk through the installation, that you'll take a little bit of time with it and think about that active world all around you Try to think about yourself in relation to it differently. And perhaps even if only for a moment our minds can bring back that childlike, sort of ludic, playful moment of unmediated connection with the workings of the natural world that as babies and children we all experienced and sort of forgot about how to experience when we got older. If it does that, then perhaps it can revitalize our connection with this more than human world in ways we desperately need. Well, hello there, good people. It's an honor to be to be part of this, and the first thing I need to say is I'm terribly sorry that I'm that I'm not there physically. I love Chongbin's work, and what I wanted to talk about um, concerning it is 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 deeply meaningful to me. Um, they do say that I'm a philosopher. Um, the the first thing I would like to say about that is that. Um, it's, I've come to realize over, over the years that philosophy does not mean having big ideas. Um, although, of course, quite a lot of philosophers, particularly the boy sorts of philosophers, seem to think that it's about having big ideas and comparing the bigness of their ideas with the bigness of other people's big ideas. I have no idea how they came to that conclusion. Um, but really, the word philosophy is made of two emotions, isn't it? Love and wisdom. And you have to admit, you know, that wisdom is an emotion. Like if you had a choice between wisdom as a set of ideas and a fortune cookie or wisdom as a feeling, I think you'd have to go with the wisdom as a feeling. 
Um, it's the D-O-M part of the word, right? It's, it's wisdom, wiseness, this feeling of wise. Um, love and wisdom. And the thing about feelings is that they're from the future, phenomenologically. So, you know, why do you go to therapy? Well, you're having a feeling, and of course that symptom, that, that feeling is a symptom of, the, of something that happened in the past, by definition. But also, phenomenologically, it's from the future, insofar as you don't know what it means yet. You can't put it into words yet. So in a funny way, a feeling is an idea that hasn't happened yet, and therefore, feelings are from the future and ideas are from the past. Now, what is this future when we think about it a little more clearly? It's not the future that you can predict, right? It's not another dot on a Wikipedia line because that really is the past that you're just sort of building out over the abyss. And there are so many things in our world that correspond to this issue. Um, neoliberal capitalism, um, the most virulent form of it so far, is really a kind of automated slavery in which um, something like an adaptive AI machine learns how to extract life from the biosphere without stopping. Now, an algorithm, aka an adaptive AI, is um, by definition based on the past. It's a recipe. That's what an algorithm is, right? You, you, you take an egg, you put it in boiling water, you wait for five minutes, you take it out, it's called a boiled egg. That's a set of instructions that tried and tested method for boiling an egg, um, at least where I live in, in, in Houston, Texas, you can stop watching now because you, you, you all, y'all are from San Francisco and this is a big problem here that I'm from Houston, Texas. But I speak to you, you know, I'm, I'm atoning for my sins to some extent by speaking to you from, from Paris, um, I hope. Um, so, so yes, a, a fate, th th this is not the future we're talking about here. The future we're talking about here is the possibility that things can be different. Um, ideology in a way, is sort of everywhere. Althusser was right about that. You know, everything is made out of ideology to a certain extent. Um, and that's the past, right? You know, the, my, my you know, very crudely, right, my, my face represents a map of the, all the things that happened to my face until, until just now. Um, and, and yet, what is a face? Who is this Tim Morton guy? That's the, that's the future. You know, and I feel like in, in, in every entity, past and future are sort of coinciding in a kind of crisscross and a kind of chiasmus. But they don't touch. This is the funny thing about the crisscrosses. It looks like they touch, but from another angle, actually, they're passing over each other, like two roads um, on a highway that sort of fly over. Um, and this kind of um, future, the, the, the futurality, um, is invisible, right? Everywhere around you is the is the past. That's what you see, and when you see um, when you see um, Chongbin's work, you see something that has been made. You know, by definition, it's it's the past you're looking at. You're looking at these metal um, oblongs. But um, what 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 are these? What does it mean? Yeah, um, that's the future. The future is also everywhere, but it's it's invisible, that's all. Um, so ideology may be everywhere, but it's not everything. There's always the possibility that things can be different. Now, invisible really is a rather uh, crude um, sort of first pass over this notion of the future, because really the future is visible, but just in a sort of different way than um, the way the past is visible. The past is very determinate. Right by definition, there's a certain shape, there's a certain structure, um, there's a certain formal quality to it. Um, the future, on the other hand, is is um, is in motion. You know, the past is sort of in a way um, a kind of stasis, but the future is rippling, moving. Um, I just wrote a book about um, the notion of spacecraft, quite a lot to do with my obsession with with Star Wars, actually. Um, and really, this was a, about my obsession with hyperspace, and in particular, George Lucas's hyperspace. Um, it's very interesting to me that um, Lucas, I think accidentally, for his image of hyperspace, chose um, what in African philosophy is called the Kalunga, in Congo philosophy, in fact. I don't believe he appropriated it directly, but the Kalunga is the bridge between the worlds. 
um, aka hyperspace, and it's shaped like the inside of a spiraling shell, and it is blue and iridescent in, in color, shimmering, um, and it's made of liquid, so it's just sort of moving. Right now, this is obviously the George Lucas hyperspace tunnel, aka the future, yeah? Everyone who wore a MAGA hat pretty much got to see this radical image um, accidentally from, from African philosophy. Um, and I'd like to think that inside every MAGA hat is, is a Kalunga hyperspace tunnel, if only we could figure out how to, how, to, how to find out. In fact, sort of everywhere is hyperspace, right? This is the, this is the basic sort of truth of Afrofuturism. You know, it's, 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 it's under here, it's in, under the table that I'm sitting at. It's sort of, it's everywhere. You just have to know how to kind of peel it, how to peel the past open to find it, right? Or how to find the future in the past is another way of describing um, any kind of um, radical historical or philosophical um, project, right? Um, because the past isn't, isn't over. Um, there is a kind of excess um, and there is a kind of infinity of ways of interpreting the past and interpretation and doing are not so different. Um, this is one of the fascinating things I feel about Chongbin's work, which is that um, the, uh, the physicality of the work is a kind of doing. Um, these, they, 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 this is a very strong in, uh, demonstration of the causality of the aesthetic. Um, what do we have here? We have these floating worlds, these floating metallic worlds. Um, metal is a crystalline structure. Um, and um, when you have a crystalline structure that is isolated as a system, physically, close to absolute zero, that is, in a vacuum, you see it, um, it's shimmering. This is what in quantum theory is called the ground state of a thing. And the, and the beautiful thing about quantum theory um, is that in, in a way it's, it's not um, a theory about kind of va vague indeterminacy, you know, um, nor is it, in fact, um, a theory about how your mind can do, can do anything to anything. Um, rather fascinatingly, Siri has just decided to um, interrupt me, um, so I will say that again. Um, it's funny because, you know, I, I was teaching irony in a, in a poetry class a couple of um, months ago, and I said, you know, can, can anyone define irony for me? And Siri said, is there something I can help you with? And I thought, oh, well... That's a pretty good example of it. Um, in their ground state, things are very determinate, right? There is no transparent, unmarked anything. Yeah, as we know, there's no transparent, unmarked gender. There's no transparent, unmarked race. And this is also born out in the physical world, right? There's, there's green energy, as it were, and there's red energy, and there's blue energy and violet energy, but there is no transparent neutral energy. There's no transparent neutral matter, matter and energy being just different modalities of the same, of the same thing, whatever that is. Um, so when I look at Jongbin's work, I see this rippling crystalline structure that is actually saying something true about its um, quantum theoretical state. Um, what's another word for this shimmering quality? Well, that's a, a life. And I've been thinking a lot about this word alive recently. Um, I've been thinking that, um, you know, um, live as opposed to survive would be a pretty good injunction for our ecological age. And I was just talking to um, French um, Extinction Rebellion yesterday, youth, um, and they were um, telling me that really they are on the side of, of, of life as opposed to conservation or preservation, which is the more sort of vanilla... Um, um, uh, it's the environmentalism that we've, that we've got, right? But what we need is this radical um, assertion of life. And it's not about life versus, versus non-life. It's not a concept um, of um, alive versus dead um, or um, bios, you, you might say in Greek, biology, right? It's the study of things that are alive rather than things that are not alive. Nor is it a legal um, concept. Um, we could call that legal concept Zoe, right? Um, as in the word zoology, you know, who or what has the right to exist, to live? 
Um, none of these words are what I mean by alive, because what I mean is the word thumos. This is a Greek word. Um, when, um, if you were an ancient Greek person, you might do this when you say thumos, because what it means is kind of core um, pulsation. Yeah, the way the way your being, your body, your your heart, is just pulsating all by its little ownsome, um, without reference to being alive. I mean, this is the trouble with the Texan anti-abortion law, right? Which is it defines this notion of the the fetal heartbeat. Um, which it's not even a heartbeat at that point. It is this pulsation. It has nothing to do with um, an entity that could be called um, a fetus, let alone a human being. Being alive. It's literally just this fibrillation of, of matter. Um, and it's actually what I saw when, when I uh, took my daughter to the cardiologist a few months ago and the very skillful technician sort of l saw her heart in, in the mode of listening to it, attending to it with a sonogram. And moving this instrument around, they were finding this kind of fibrillating, trembling entity um, and um, it was it was incredibly beautiful, actually, um, more beautiful in, in for, for me um, than 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 seeing her in utero, and I and I cried. Um, and you know when you're when you're when you're sort of um, far away from the from the pulsation, it's you know that dark side of the moon kind of gung 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 sort of um, pulse. But when you get up close, there's this kind of kind of ripply quality, right, which is why you can have a heart attack or an arrhythmia, because really this fibrillating thing has nothing to do with this steady drumbeat um, called, called um, uh, life rather than non-life, if you see what I mean. Nor does it have to do with surviving. Um, many of us know about survival mode, right, which is that I'm going to continue and damn the torpedoes. Um, that's not living, that's surviving. Um, and as a whole, um, uh, white Western patriarchy has been surviving um, at the expense of everything else for quite some time. And um, we're about to stress test um, this concept um, of, of white patriarchy on the, on the biosphere. Um, it would be a very good idea right now to end um, patriarchy and white supremacy um, because um, they are based on, in, in, for all kinds of reasons, but the, the, in this sense, they're about surviving rather than, rather than living at the expense of everything else. They are about primitively accumulating, you know, when it comes to capitalism, huge piles of things. These slender oblongs of, of trembling metal are, cannot be, you can't grasp them, um, you can't accumulate them. Um, they they float and they and they shimmer, and um, they uh, they do something to you. Um, I, I've, not unlike actually, when I when I look at a painting by Bridget Riley, um, there is this quality of actually working on my optic nerve um, when I see this work. Um, that it's not actually something to look at. It's something in a way. It's looking at me. Um, and I don't want to get too into, you know, the Lacanian language of the gaze, you know, which is this notion that the, the so-called object is, is looking at me um, because, you know, any subject-object duality is really a master-slave duality, as my friend Denise um, points out, Denise Ferreira da Silva, who, who wrote this incredible book called um, Towards a Global Idea of Race. Um, so this is not about an, um, an object glinting at a, at a subject. Um, it's about two beings, um, eyes and the art interacting. And it's about how, <clears throat> although there is a kind of stillness about this work, um, it is also moving, um, shimmering, um, rippling. Um, what are we looking at, in fact, is um, in a way what we're looking at in Chongbin's work here is hyperspace. We're looking at the future. We're looking at the possibility that things can be different. Um, and I, I feel like this, um, this is a deeply utopian project. 
um, and that these um, slender, fragile, thin, not accumulative um, entities, you know, I, I don't really want to call them objects because we have a prejudice, what that means, um, are inviting us to um, imagine the possibility that the things can be different and there is a kind of fragility in, in that vision. Um, but that is another kind of power, um, the gentleness of the future, as opposed to the lapidary determinacy of the past is another kind of power that is also a, a, a political power. And this shimmering life is, is actually precisely the life in the phrase Black Lives Matter, yeah, which again is a, comes from the future, right? Like, wouldn't it be great if that was true? Um, if the default form of art is, is dance, right? Um, it means that um, all art causes uh, one's body to move. In this case, perhaps rather superficially, one is looking up your body moves there to look up um, and the default dance I think is called being alive isn't it you know you you get up you brush your teeth you go to SF MoMA um, sometimes it's a rather boring repetitive dance but it's a dance yeah and the default alive is called being asleep just lying still and your body is pulsing zhum, 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 and your, your mind is pulsing with the dreams spontaneously without being pushed hopefully you know and this is what they mean and this is the this is the direct non-violent direct action so-called dead weight but it's not really it's a sort of minimal alive weight you know the, the the police have trouble lifting your body because you just let yourself go limp yeah there's something about the limpness of these floating forms that is actually very very radical very very undramatic very choreographic dancing you know we don't know who's the goody and who's the baddie but there is this shimmering movement in the stillness um so um this this lecture i decided to call things are looking up because that's what i feel when i see this work and i hope that it um inspires people to to look up and to sort of step out of a kind of tragic mode of, of thinking the um, climate crisis that we are in, this terrible emergency, um, this mass extinction. It's all too easy to be in tragedy mode. But unfortunately, um, and I don't have a lot of time to explain this, tragedy mode is part of the problem. And what we really need is a kind of comedy mode. That doesn't mean laughing at the situation. It means coexisting. You know, here we all are underneath the sheltering work of Chongben. And, you know, um, there can be love, there can be hate, there can be joy, there can be silliness in, in comedy, but all those affects and emotions are not fighting each other or reducing each other. They're all kind of uneasily coexisting and uneasy coexistence um, would be a great way of describing um, what it means to be a symbiotically embodied being living in a biosphere. So things are looking up. Thank you for listening to this. And I'm, again, I'm so sorry that I, that I can't be there. And I hope that in the future we can um, carry on um, talking and working together, Chongbin. And um, I'm, I'm honored that you wanted me to be, to be part of this. Let's move to a conversation about how Chongbin does this amazing work and Chongbin's practice more generally. And then, of course, any questions that you have, um, let's, let's hear it from Chongbin uh, to introduce some aspects of his incredible practice as a collaborator with the agency of nature throughout his body of work. Thank you. Oh, boy, now it might be better. Is that enough? Okay, are we good? All right, so I think me. my one's turned on already. We're gonna yeah. have a little feedback rock okay. concert. Okay, I'm gonna, gonna get, get all Jimmy Hendrix with you here. Um, so, Chong Bin, would you like to, I guess we, I wasn't able to see the images being shared while I was speaking, but um, would you like to tell us a little bit about how you started working in the very beginning 
with, na with natural agency, how you saw yourself as collaborating with something more than just you know, the artist genius, artist vision, and, and, and how you started to see material as something more than just something you could use to do something. How do you, how did you start collaborating with the natural world well, in your work? I yeah, I think as uh, I'm looking back because I was, uh, you know, I, I'm a painter and uh, for many decades. Uh, and of course, the idea, I uh, work on paintings, uh, you always think about an image and somehow sort of disconnect with what actually material is because it's always thinking, what do I paint? And that was very early on. And, but through the time, I realized that. I'm actually not really depicts anything. It's every day, it's actually, it was you dealing with what's surrounding you, including your own material, media base. And so I, that first body of work, that you, the very first one, you've got some images of it you can share with us, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but I'm gonna, we're gonna you talk show about this first? one and we we'll go back. Okay, or, awesome. Yeah. But you and guys, we need to deal with this maybe, feedback here. Every time I turn towards Chongbin, we have a little yeah, Jimi Hendrix concert yeah. going on. Thanks. Yeah, and so, so the media sort of became very kind of important uh, sort of the way that it, for me to mediate between me and surroundings. And again, my notion to my own studio even changed because the studio became kind of a different surface, different environment. And mm -hmm. so it heightened my senses in a way when I work on the pieces, the paintings, and I don't really think about opinions, I think about how things are flow, how things are behaves, yeah. and look things in all different dimensions. So when Abby asked me to uh, think about this atrium, uh, you know, I kind of really loved the place what we call the quite challenging space. Because usually you could actually expect it to place in the white boxes and museum spaces or gallery space. So, uh, but I do actually really like the place is really unstable. And, and very accessible, and, and, and all has the public dynamics and chaos, in other words. Uh, I'm not saying the lobby is chaotic, but in some way, my stand is chaotic because there's a lot of uh, different entities and elements and, and visual encounters, uh, including the people's, you know, all passing through and everything. So I spent a lot of time sitting there looking. Uh, I love this irregular in a way shape because it's cutting open columns and but mainly is is the work that is in the approach is about light. And so why is light? Because I see the light as full of substance. And the light actually really connects to kind of much more the infinite, but the light also has many notions, uh, whether in the Western notion or East notions. You can actually but in, in a direct sense, uh, through the different work, use different media to play with the light. And I kind of beginning to always focus on what the physiology of, of the media that I can actually translate light. Uh, it really comes from where actual the uh, environment place that I, I sort of feel like almost like your own language, which can use those vocabulary to describe the most accurate, most effective way. Um, so maybe one way we can help people sort of ground this yeah. incredible process is it, some images, because I, I know you have some amazing, when you first started out, in the well, very beginning, when you first started realizing that there was something beyond you know, the human art creator, that you were engaging with something, um, you, you have some slides, I think, of yeah. The very early artworks when you just stopped doing video work and started painting. Um, maybe we could share some of those. And you, you wanted me to start from the beginning, or I think to, yeah. maybe like you okay. guys want to hear actually, can the you journey roll, that just shortcut been. right to the beginnings? Actually. Yeah, I think the journey that you've we, been we on. We come back to this piece. Uh, to this I think we come back to this piece okay. at the very end yeah. because you started out. This is an incredible journey that Jungbin has gone on, and to see how each step has evolved and how the actual artistic practice has developed. Yeah. This well, this is actually the source of what I'm thinking, human, non-humans, in terms of, of, at the time, it was doing this entitled Another State of Man, which is um, very much, in a way, looking by mor mor biomorphic forms and reading Kafka's and <laughs> all these existential. And in the one, this one I did it was 1988, anyway, 87 to 88, whole series. 
the idea is very initial idea was break away from the representational work into the abstractions. And I kind of look at things out, particularly in the human, that is very much connected, connected to all the different uh, species, uh, different uh, behaviors, different object. So the figure was referred to many, some animal forms, some instrument forms that are a combination of this kind of a figurative, but it's different beings. And that sort of initial beginning idea was breaking into is that we are not only ourselves, but it's, it's all different sort of things emerge as that kind of relationship. So and just so, like in our, in our gut, like we have millions of different kinds of, of bacteria and we live and our bodies have more non-human cells than human cells. But we don't always, if we think of ourselves as a unit alone, but they're actually made up of multiple things. And then how did you start, how did you discover the fractal the fractal character that became such an incredible, important part of your painting language. Yeah, it's sort of a jump that. from 80, 88 uh, to this one is 2009, 2011, something like that. So, uh, and what it was is like, started to get away from entirely in this imagery and in semi, semi kind of a, the abstract, that stage, the one that I show you yeah. almost 20 years ago. And yeah. to this one, which through the, period that I mentioned that I was working very much in the uh, observing the media, how it found, uh, how it plays. So the paintings that I use, I may talk a little bit about it very quick, which is use the brush and, and, and the papers and the waters and the acrylic. And so part of the reason I use acrylic was I was dissatisfied with ink that is, that is in the way that I feel engaged much more in the rich materialities and more tangible way. And so in the way that how the acrylic can build form, layers and reflection even, the lights that integrated with the ink, uh, which basically kind of trash the purity of the ink. But it does give me the idea or the experience of see how things flow, how it's seep through the paper and then forms kind of almost like sculptural form, imprint everything from the floor. Uh, and so all the merge of liquid and, and, and uh, uh, the, uh, all the uh, uh, sort of the how it picks up the, all the residues from the, from the floors and everything that has became dimensional to me. So and so I did practice on the layers, uh, physically practice the layers and you know. So what I found was interesting during this period is Chung Bin Stop, not only stop trying to draw, depict and represent, but also wasn't interested in doing abstract work anymore either. And instead, stopped doing sort of what's called gestural work, stopped trying to sort of depict his inner state, or in fact, and you started to, right. to, well, to get rid of the use of the brush altogether in some circumstances. Right. Right. So I, all these forms, maybe you can show something that has a fractal, okay, as you start to have work, so there's all these this forms, a, and how did you discover? So how did you discover well, that these forms are self-organizing? That he you don't he didn't make these forms, he didn't paint them, he didn't bring them into being. He let them give them a space to emerge themselves. How did you discover this? Well, it's again, it's uh, it's a lot of the times you working is come with an accident, but the, the, this accident actually lies the what how media performs in place. It's for me to see that happen, then I think it's very important. You mentioned about the gestural. Uh, the way much early on they get rid of a gestural because they don't want entirely hands-on, being very subjectively uh, working uh, as what I sort of uh, pre sort of has, uh, has conceptualized to do it. But I want to actually give a space to the media that I became part of facilitate. And so this is a sort of a way they enable me to do the work not only uh, on the one surface, but it's working with the environment into what's happening. And so those media actually, it happened in a way how the waters or ink and pushes all the particles and just like in the natures, how geographically things are formed, land forms. And so this is sort of really a way of presenting uh, what actually thing and has its own way. And so, so was um, this this what, so this moment when you saw these fractal forms emerging that go back so you see no the the, the one forward with the, the fractal forms 
this one? Yes. Yeah. Okay. You see, you see how some of these look like the like the lungs or coral or mountain ridges or riverbanks. Chongbin did not draw these shapes. He did not use a brush to make them emerge. Instead, what I found fascinating about this practice is that by this happy accident, Chongbin discovered if you let the material speak its own language, it actually has something to say consistently. That this is what the, this is the material itself performing its own being. And Chongbin, as an artist, this is when you began he started to see yourself as collaborating with the material right. rather than the master of the material, right? You let the material, as you get to know how it works, mm -hmm. its physical properties, give it space to unfurl its own formal way of being. And these shapes are not created by you. No. But they're no, space I mean, they're shapes that you anticipate because you understand the material, right? You give them space to come into being right, by letting right. the agency right. of the materials have a space to unfold yeah, in the work. Yeah. For me, that was a very exciting moment. Well, although how I, this, yeah, how I, change your I didn't really actually focus on what, how, this is sort of in a way that I don't take grant for this is effect that I wanted to maximize that effect. The effect that only works is because, uh, help me to understand how in a relationship that is, uh, that is the, uh, what we actually think about the form, think about the knowledge in terms of understanding uh, the, uh, how the sort of a relationship and dynamic between the world and, and what I want to paint. And so I show the studio space because of the for all, it's actually part of the work uh, because of the, what things I am doing is not only no longer on the painting on the surface, I cutting, folding, all these methods engage, which is entirely a blur, blur kind of boundary between painting or sculptures all object, if you were saying. Uh, but it does, a way I start engaging with painting, looking at it as how human perceptions, in a way that directs towards the experience. Mm -hmm. And so, um, the piece that I had, this one, there was the uh, kind of a folding the bars, all the cross bars, cross underneath the papers, where uh, the actual geometry is sort of dissolved through the natural process, which very much, in a way, Create a kind of dynamic field, and that's sort of how do I sort of way structure my paintings. Yeah. And um, do you have some more of the images of the paintings that have some of those fractal forms that you became an, a master of letting them emerge? Um, um, and we'll see some of them maybe, in the gallery maybe space. Some Are might, there any yeah, more? Gallery yeah. space will be actually yeah. we'll see okay. the actual pieces. So but from that moment, this is this is what informed and shift towards your video practice. Can you tell us a little bit about? how you started to return after this long absence from doing video work, after discovering that you could collaborate with materials, Kimmerich Landscape in 2015 was a piece that we worked on together, I curated, and you did it at the Venice Biennale um, during that time. Mm -hmm. And maybe you can show a little bit of it. And yeah. this is the moment where the ink painting left the canvas or the paper, left the frame, and moved into the video and this is where, where I think a magical moment happens where you can start to see the formal similarities between the art materials and these are blood cells, right? And all kinds of other things in the natural world that have the same forms and behave in the same ways. And Chomin starts to tap into that um, in the work. Yeah, this is the Pokimeric uh, the, uh, landscape, but the, uh, mainly I was exploring the how use the flow of ink to really uh, to engage what actual world actually is in terms of uh, like for example this is from geometry into the fractal geometries and how things uh, uh, sort of alternates each other and then this dynamic flows from the water became the pattern and so that pattern sort of reveal how water forms and I, I ref reflected on the early paintings of in different stage of uh, uh, early stage of the uh, work that in the early times in the Song Dynasty's work that has showed different stage of the paintings uh, in the in the waves and this is to the cell mutatings which very much it's uh, almost uh, you know when they work on ink pieces that the secretions kind of almost feel the secretions of this, uh, layers of uh, liquid. Which, which actually induced many different kind of uh, 
uh, movement. And so, the, what, so, so speaking of movement, so watch guys, this ink blot, you get to see it sped up, because usually you just see the final product that looks static, but ink is actually a dynamic medium. So Chomby captures that in this video, which is part of an, an environmental installation, captures ink actually taking its form and then showing the similarities between those forms that the ink takes on its own because it is carbon and water and, and also has collagen with forms that exist in, out there in nature. And this is where he began mediating, meditating on these ideas and juxtaposing them and then creating an environmental installation. Um, maybe you can describe the room that we created in Venice a little bit. Uh, yeah, this is the, yeah, this is the, uh, the the Venice one actually Jay saw, <laughs> Jay and Jennifer saw, and this is a sort of immersive room. I create the entire rooms, which is, has a multi through the reflective materials uh, in the floors and on the wall, and then also play with the uh, the scrim, which is set in the in the distance that how the way reacts to the light. So the light becomes entirely active, not only the projection, the image on. What you see is on the center pieces on is the actual uh, area of the, the image has been projected, but rest is actually all reflective and the lights bouncing that all the image is sort of uh, showing in a different angles and different dimensions. Uh, so um, it really actually has, the way I actually really like the, the, the screen, scrim, uh, is because of this certain those type of scrim and really uh, conducting the light, in a, in distorted light in a many different forms in a way. So the light, the wave changes and the bounces. It really uh, engage your actual body experience as you walk in space. When so, we go out there after we do, do this as part of the, the walkthrough, you'll get to experience. You'll see the scrim, they're installed, and there's projections on them. And the scrim has a distance between the, 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 the projection space. So it becomes the, remember I talked about a diffraction grid, the tiny little millions of tiny little holes in this well, mesh screen allows something wild to happen. And as you move, new patterns will appear before your eyes that you're creating by moving. You know, one, one of the idea I think is, you know, I always think is the liquid. Liquid is, liquid is very important because they always flows. They never yes. settles. They never sort of draw the conclusions. Yeah. In a way, I mentioned why I liked the scrim, because the scrim is you could actually see the idea in front, but also see through, and the things in between. So it really has a kind of causal, uh, causal kind of dynamics that you can be realized and it can be actually experienced with. So I kind of play in that media uh, in many different places, but also, you know, what we talked to about the, the perforated sheets, which will be another sort of apertures and, and dealing with lights to, to continue to that. So this is a, yes. the multi-dimensional image in sort of a, in the entire way of a, a seeing, seeing the uh, space is in a very different way. Yeah. Um, so, Sean, this is, I, sorry, I want to do a time check so that we do have yes. um, an opportunity to go into the galleries. Okay. Um, which close at 8. We have been given a little bit of an extension, but I want uh, to have that opportunity. Okay. Um, do you want to just show a couple more images? Yeah, I can show more images. And then that way people yeah. can ask more intimate questions as well and face to face when we put our masks back on. <laughs> yeah. So this is this is sort of all the reference that is surrounding where I live and then the, I've observed every day and I wanted to kind of how did I incorporate it into my practice. Uh, So this piece is actually in the galleries, which has been using entire flow of water to working with the things became because liquid, but also the the, the uh, solidifying in, in, in the same same ways that uh, to achieve the surface of paintings. When we yeah. Know, we so we we'll see directly, that. Yeah. It'll be easier to see than in the photo. Yeah. And then this is also it's a real reactive to the way further reactive to all the airs, airs, and 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 tensions, contraction. Uh, this is an installation that I uh, call it, I, uh, I, the, uh, the Wall of the Skies, which the is Shanghai Biennale. Shanghai Biennale, and at the studio as well. Uh, this is the close-up look, which would the surface of the ink on this, uh, on this entire 
room, which is the front, is created uh, entire sort of geom geometries of all kind of like trapezoid sort of surface that actually continuously that the meet with the angle of the wall, which is set in in you can see the wall that is rebuilt sort of angle ways and and the, the really sort of full can connect way through the, the front pieces and wrap around the entire room and through the reflection of light and uh, this is just one minute of the uh, that doesn't work. Oh, that video, I guess. So, yeah, so this is the piece. And this is a user a scream uh, called the walking penumbra, uh, which is you walking the layer space. The video became, video light became the video uh, transforming into the light, how that actually carries image through the different layers of the space that uh, you in every corner, every place you were sort of alternates yourself in the experience of, in terms of the space. Um, you actually, that part of idea, video turning to light, which is in the Osher galleries. Uh, with, uh, this is the, in the Kyoto, uh, in the, uh, the called Kenyanji's uh, temple. It's one of the oldest temple in Kyoto. Uh, and the, I did the entire installation in the temple, so it transformed the place, bring outside of the, uh, the different entities and from the gardens and all climate, and then sort of connect into the, to the inside of the space. Uh, and uh, this is the one of the example. Uh, this is actually show you that this is the water basin outside. I, I actually spend many time going back and forth. And one day I saw that water basin has a reflection to the sky and a half to the roof lines. But whenever wind breathes and, and has a ripple effect. So I kind of like that. The, the elements of this sort of natu natural phenomenon. So I wanted to put it into Tokonoma space, which is designed with the LED panels, live stream uh, of what's happening in outside. And um, yeah, this is the... Uh, Again, scrims are being used to put right. the light, yeah. attract the light into an which interactive I, experience. This installation, I did a lot of uh, perforated uh, panels, uh, use the PVCs and also the uh, the thick paper stocks. We did all the laser uh, designed, and which is created entire different uh, the layers of apertures that uh, translates the, that really bring the outside of the, the views and into the inside as views in there. Same, this is reflective. Um, and I'll show this. And this is the I look for the sky, which would yeah. be better to look at look at in person because the. Again, again, the photo of it isn't the work. The yeah. Scaffolding isn't yeah. the work. The work is going to happen when you experience it. And it is skylight, you know, Alante skylight, which has brought enormous lights. And I, the reason I said it is, is kind of a, uh, so much of structures and lights and shadows. So I want to create a corridor space, which is the geometry modulars. Uh, so I did some sketches and designs, uh, then rotates in the six different. Two sets rotating different orientation, and that changes the entire. Shall we go and walk through the installation space while we still have time? Sure. Yeah, because I think at this point, to see the work live when it's right here is the best thing we could possibly do.